Welcome back to Every Naval Battle in History. This is going to be another episode where we skip over the many frustrating battles where not much is known and get to an absolutely fascinating outing on our old friend the Yangtze River. So for the sake of completeness, here's what we're skipping over. 851, the Battle of Sandwich. The West Saxons under Athelstan beat a Danish force at Kent. A solid win for the English, who we shall be hearing a lot more from. Also bear in mind, the Viking period only began in 793, and didn't they provide an impetus for developing naval forces in the region? In 872, the Battle of Cardia was fought by the Byzantine Admiral Nicetas Orifus, and they defeated a fleet of the feared Cretan Saracens. In 873, at the Battle of the Gulf of Corinth, Nicetas Orifus again defeated those Cretan Saracens, this time killing their admiral, the renegade Byzantine Photius. This one was noteworthy because the Byzantines dragged their ships over the Isthmus of Corinth to surprise the Cretans. In 880, at the battles of Cephalonia and Stellae, the Byzantine admiral Nassar defeated the Aglabids. This would seem to indicate that the Byzantines of this period were churning out a lot of competent naval leaders, with Nassar following on from Nicetas Orifus. In 885, the Frisians, kind of sort of proto-Dutch, had a win over the Vikings. In 888, the Aglabids, that's <coughs> Carthage, <coughs> returned to form at the Battle of Milazzo and drowned thousands of Byzantines, largely driving that empire from southern Italy as a result. In 906, the Byzantine Admiral Himerios had a big win somewhere over an Arab fleet on St. Thomas's Day. you got to love that about the Byzantines. Where was the battle? Dunno. When was the battle? Meh. Does it matter? What was the Saints' Feast Day when the battle was fought? Oh, it's St. Thomas's Day. We know that. In 912, at the Battle of Chios, Himerios got himself and a huge fleet of 177 dromons and 43,000 men ambushed by a Saracen fleet, with near total annihilation of those Byzantines ensuing. Which brings us to 919 and the Battle of Langshan Jiang, or Wolf Mountain River, if you prefer, roughly between Nanjing and modern Shanghai. Last time we checked in, China was enjoying a golden age under the Tang Dynasty. So, what happened? Well, the Tang in their declining years started devolving more power to regional military governors, and those governors started handing their positions on to their children. And before you know it, you've got regional dynasties and none of them want to pay their taxes. A tale as old as time. In 907, this ushered in the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, which sounds like a confusing thing to live through, assuming you're lucky enough to live through it. It would run to 979 with the founding of the Song Dynasty, who would eventually unite the Southern Ten Kingdoms, although China would not be fully reunified until the Mongols turned up to sort them out centuries later. Despite this political turmoil, the competing kingdoms drove a lively cultural and commercial period of relative prosperity. In this battle, amongst these wars, on one side we have a revived kingdom of Wu, based around Yang Zhao, very much masters of the lower Yangtze River. On the other side, we have Wu Yu, just to the east of Wu, a coastal power but also holding territory upriver of Wu. To kick things off, the later Liang Emperor ordered Wu Yu to attack Wu with a riverine naval force coming from Chang Zhao. Leading the Wu Yu fleet is Qian Yangguan, the founder of the Wu Yu kingdom. Here's a fun fact. They appear to have had Greek fire. So much for the secrecy surrounding that weapon. Whether this was copied from the Byzantines or a parallel development or inspired and reverse engineered is not at all clear to me. Either way, the Wu Yu fleet definitely had effective flamethrowers. Both sides are described as having 500 dragon ships. These may have been based on modern-day dragon boats, or just been river warships with dragons carved into the bows. But only one side had dragons that breed fire. I just want to quickly note the image I've got for this battle was generated by the Dali AI and has no basis in historic fact. To make things ever worse for the hapless Wu fleet, the Wu Yu force had a cunning plan. They had loaded their ships with ashes, sand and beans. What were they planning? Some sort of barbecue? To pull off the plan, first they gained the weather gauge, itself entirely capable of delivering victory. That is, they got upwind of the warships and from there could dictate the engagement. 
Then they threw the ashes into the wind, so it blew into the eyes of the hapless Wu sailors. Wu has effectively lost this battle twice already, and Wu Yu is just getting started. The sand was used to cover the decks so they wouldn't set themselves on fire with the flamethrowers. Then, as they closed on the Wu fleet, they somehow threw the beans onto the decks of those ships. The hard round beans acted as ball bearings, making it hard to maintain a footing on the decks. So the Wu fleet has been beaten to the weather gauge, blinded, and incapacitated. After all that, the Wu Yu fleet let rip with flamethrowers. Here's what a Wu Yu source had to say about the outcome. We killed more than a hundred of their officers, including their commander, and took 7,000 of their men as prisoners. We burnt over 400 of their ships and killed so many of their men that the river water was red with blood for several tens of li. Uh, li is 500 metres, so we're talking many miles of the great river red with blood. Wu Yu would endure to 978 when it was absorbed by the Song Dynasty. Strap in folks, we've got lots more to cover as we take on every naval battle in history. Smash those like and subscribe buttons, ring that bell, you don't want to get left behind.